next we have Chris Baer. He's here from the University of Utah. And he's going to talk about the ocular manifestations of Zika virus. There we go. <clears throat> well, good morning. Like Renee said, my name is Chris Baer. I'm one of the fourth year medical students here at the University of Utah. And I'm really excited to be able to talk with you this morning about a topic that I think is very interesting and also uh, very timely. We're going to spend the next few minutes discussing the ocular manifestations of Zika virus. And the purpose of this talk is really twofold. Um, first, we're going to spend a few minutes just talking about some basic background information about Zika virus. I think as health professionals, it's important that we have a baseline working knowledge about uh, this condition. Because if you haven't gotten questions about Zika already, chances are you're going to get them in the future. Unfortunately, Zika virus is not going away anytime soon, and it's likely going to become an even bigger issue as people travel down to Brazil for the Olympics coming up here. So we're going to spend a few minutes just talking about some background information there. Next, and where we're going to spend the majority of our time, is discussing the ocular manifestation of Zika virus. And um, that's where we'll spend the majority of our time here. So a little bit of background. Zika is a member of the flavivirus family, um, which also includes pathogens such as dengue fever, uh, West Nile virus and chikungunya. It's transmitted primarily by the Aedes mosquito, and you can see that bug here. And this is a map of its presence here in the United States. You can see that it doesn't have a, a really large presence here in Utah, but throughout the rest of the southern United States, it's got a, a pretty, pretty wide area that it covers. While mosquito transmission is the most prevalent form of, of uh, transmission, it can also be transmitted, importantly, from mother to fetus in utero, and it can also be transmitted sexually, and that includes both from men and from women. This slide is just to show kind of the timeline of what we know about Zika virus. The first case was reported in 1952, and then we had a period of almost 60 years where it was really pretty quiet. We didn't hear much about Zika. And then in 2007, we had our first outbreak. In 2013, we had a second outbreak. And now in 2015, we have uh, an outbreak here in Brazil that we all know about. And I've put this up here just to show that there's something different about this strain of Zika virus. Why would we have a period of uh, you know, relative quiet for the past 60 years, and then within the past 10 years, we've had three major outbreaks here. There's a lot of interesting theories about why that is, and that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. You know, what's different about this particular uh, strain of Zika virus? When people present with symptoms of Zika virus, um, sometimes, most of the time, there will actually won't be any symptoms. 80% of people with Zika will be asymptomatic, and when they do present with symptoms, most of the time they're going to be um, very nonspecific symptoms. Specifically from an ophthalmology standpoint, uh, the most common symptom that we see is a non purulent conjunctivitis. It tends to be self-limited. Um, now, the symptom in infants that's beginning the most press lately is microcephaly. And in Brazil, at, since the start of this outbreak, their rates of microcephaly have actually increased um, over 20-fold. So it's, it's a big deal, and that's uh, why it's been getting a lot of press here. To diagnose Zika virus, um, the test that was used for a long time was a, was a PCR test. Um, and now we also have the ability to do um, ELISA testing with IgM antibodies. So that's a real quick kind of background on just some basics about Zika virus. Now we're going to get to the point um, that we want to talk about is the ocular manifestations of Zika virus. And um, we've had a couple outbreaks, like we said, in 2007 and 2013. And the only ocular manifestations that we really saw in those outbreaks was that non-purulent, self-limited conjunctivitis. But over the last about six months, there's been uh, a lot of new information that's come out about new ocular findings in Zika virus. And so I want to take you through uh, and kind of run you through the timeline of the research that's been done over the past six months and show you kind of the evolution of, of our knowledge of these uh, ocular findings as we go along. So in January of this year, a group led by Dr. Ventura published the very first paper about ocular findings in infants. And so this is a small case series, three infants with microcephaly who were born to women with presumed Zika virus infection. Now remember that term, presumed Zika virus infection. We're going to come back to it in a minute. What they found in this study was that all the infants had cerebral calcifications, which you'll see is a recurring theme in infants who are affected with Zika virus. All of them had unilateral uh, macular pigment modeling and loss of their foveal reflex. And one infant in particular had pretty severe macular neuroretinal atrophy, which you can see on this uh, image right here. Now, the limitations of this study, obviously it's a very small sample size, three patients. Um, and this, this phrase, presumed Zika virus infection, is something I want to just highlight for a moment. This is a weakness of a lot of these early studies that we're going to talk about. Um, 
At this time, the only way to diagnose Zika virus was through that PCR test. And that PCR test was really only useful during the acute phase of symptoms, so during the first week or so of, of women who had symptoms. Now, obviously, these women who had symptoms during their pregnancy, and now we're looking at them you know, after delivery, um, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to test them at this time. And so what the Ministry of Health in Brazil decided was to diagnose a woman with Zika virus in pregnancy, they had to meet a couple different clinical criteria. Number one, they had to have symptoms of Zika virus during pregnancy, which these women had. Number two, they had to have um, uh, other viral causes, other congenital infections ruled out. So that includes things like toxoplasmosis, HIV, rubella, and a few others. And so uh, that's a limitation of some of these earlier studies that we're basing our determinations on clinical findings rather than through serology. In February, Dr. Ventura's group again published a slightly larger case series, um, this time 10 infants with microcephaly, and all of these infants had ocular pathology. Uh, in this study, 70% of these uh, mothers had Zika-like symptoms during pregnancy, and again, they met that clinical criteria with a negative serology for some of these other uh, congenital infections. Now, this is a fairly busy table, just kind of delineating the, uh, the ocular manifestations that they saw there. I've broken it down for us here a little bit easier to see. So there were 17 total affected eyes, and they, um, uh, they broke them down into two basic big findings. There were optic nerve abnormalities that they saw, and in this top picture, you can see a really nice example of optic nerve hypoplasia with a nice um, double ring sign right there, as well as um, they also noticed optic nerve pallor and an increase in the cup to disc ratio. They also found several macular abnormalities. Uh, again, we talked about loss of the foveal reflex, pigment modeling, and then chorioretinal atrophy. And this bottom picture really shows, I think, a nice example of uh, that pigment modeling found in one of these infant's eyes. Uh, that same month, a separate group independently published a study that was very similar and had very similar results. Uh, this is a slightly larger study, 29 microcephalic infants, um, 10 of whom had ocular findings. And interestingly, the same percentage, about 70% of mothers had uh, symptoms of Zika virus during their, during their pregnancy. This is a, a table, uh, again, of the findings. And again, we see very similar uh, results. So pigment modeling, chorioretinal atrophy, and optic nerve abnormalities are by far the most common abnormalities we see uh, in these affected infants. And again, here are some pictures that really just kind of highlight uh, some of the findings that we see here in this top picture. Um, we have an enlarged cup to disc ratio bilaterally, along with some pigment modeling and a chorioretinal uh, atrophy there in the left. And then on the, bo and on the bottom picture, we see again um, chorioretinal uh, scarring there, as well as, as, well as uh, optic nerve abnormalities in these infants. Now, in May, Dr. Ventura's group published what I think is a very important study. Um, this is a study that uh, was the first time that serology was able to be used to uh, definitively uh, prove that Zika virus was in these infants. So what they did is they had 40 infants with microcephaly. 22 of these infants had ocular pathology. Um, now, during the course of their testing, this IgM ELISA testing became available. And so they were able to test 24 of the 40 infants with this IgM ELISA testing, and very importantly, all of them. So 100% of these infants tested positive for Zika virus, which I think uh, is an important, uh, important clue that Zika virus was present. And the way that we did it before with symptomatology um, actually bore out the results here in serology, that all of them were positive. Now, this study looked at risk factors for developing ocular pathology um, in Zika virus infection. I want to highlight just a couple things. So first, they found that the size of the baby's head, so head circumference was a significant factor. So those infants with smaller head circumferences had a significantly increased risk for developing ocular pathology. Now, interestingly, I thought um, axial length really wasn't a significant factor. And maturity of the baby, so whether they were born preterm, postterm, or on time, didn't have a significant impact either. Now, while uh, timing of delivery wasn't important, timing of symptoms was, and they found that women who had symptoms in the first trimester were statistically significantly at an increased risk for having a baby born with, uh, with ocular pathology. And so this answered a couple important questions here. Number one, by confirming diagnosis with serology. And number two, delineating uh, the timing of symptoms uh, that was important. Now, there was still one, I think, big question that remains to be unanswered here, and that's this. If you remember back in all these studies, all of the infants that we've looked at were microcephalic. And microcephaly, independent of anything else, is associated with, with ocular pathology, not dissimilar to what we've seen here before. And so the question becomes, do these infants have these ocular findings because of Zika virus infection, or 
are these ocular findings due to microcephaly that's induced secondary to Zika virus infection? It's a subtle distinction, but I think it's an important one. And so just last month, Dr. Ventura's group again published this case report uh, of, a, of a normal cephalic infant who had this uh, chororetinal um, lesion right here that we've seen, I think, in previous slides. And this infant tested positive for Zika virus by, uh, by our ELISA testing. And so this is, again, one case report. It's not, uh, it's not you know, anything uh, conclusive, but it does show that, uh, it does provide some bit of evidence that uh, infants who are normal cephalic can, in fact, present uh, with these lesions due to Zika virus, and maybe suggest that Zika virus itself is responsible for these lesions and not microcephaly that's secondarily induced. So, I want to end with this, uh, with this particular case report here. This was published just very recently. Um, and I, I think this highlights an important point. Now, this, uh, this patient here um, presented uh, with, with symptoms of Zika virus that were concerning. Um, and he tested positive for Zika virus by both PCR and IgM. Now, we said before that in all the case reports and all the literature that we have on Zika virus, we've had these two outbreaks in 2007 and 2013, the only findings that we saw in Zika virus were conjunctivitis. Um, but this patient presented here uh, positive for Zika virus and ended up developing uh, uveitis. And an, an anterior chamber paracentesis was done, and aqueous humor tested positive for Zika virus. Um, it may not project very well here, but this, this picture here is trying to show that there's uh, KPs present as well as uh, inflammatory cells present in the anterior chamber, um, you know, kind of highlighting that picture of uveitis. This patient's uh, visual acuity worsened uh, slightly. He was treated with Cipridex and um, ended up recovering very well. According to the case report, he's doing quite nicely. But I think this highlights an important point. Um, this, this strain of Zika virus that we're dealing with right now is presumably different than what we've seen in the past. And so we're going to see symptoms that are different than what we've seen in the past. And so, you know, the chances that we see a, a case of Zika virus is admittedly very low, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. And so if someone comes in with, you know, concerning symptoms, a suspicious travel history, Zika should be in the back of our mind and should remain on our differential um, for two important reasons. You know, number one, it helps us to, to treat the patient the best way possible. But number two, because we know that Zika virus is a sexually transmitted virus as well, if we identify these patients who are at risk, we can hopefully prevent pregnancies that are, uh, you know, affected by uh, a congenital infection as well. And so there's a lot of questions still remaining to be answered, and I think the research is still evolving. You can see this is all over the past six months, but it's kind of been exciting to see how things have evolved and how things have progressed and how much our knowledge has gained um, over just the past six months. So um, there's a lot to cover here in a short time. I really appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you all may have.